But everybody, welcome to Sacred Cash Cow Tipping. Yes, it's still a thing in 2019. Um, we really appreciate you all coming out and we're going to be talking about how to bypass endpoint security products and what that actually entails and what that means. And I know that there's a collection of people that like to say that that's just a whole bunch of stunt hacking. And yes, it is. Some people say, well, that's just marketing. Yes, it is. Um, but honestly, there's a larger narrative that we're going to try to tie together in these particular sessions that we are constantly talking about with our customers and our students, whenever we're teaching at SANS classes and so on. But I am joined by a fairly illustrious crew of individuals. Um, so I have Joff is on with me. So Joff, say hi. Hello, everybody. Good to see you. Thank you very much for joining. Um, we have Jordan who's hanging out and I'm pretty sure should be on a customer call at the moment. And we'll wait for Jordan to say hi, but his microphone is not going live. Um, so we're just going to let that go. See, this is a good chance for the rest of the BHIS people that are here as staff to activate their microphones. Um, we also have B.B. King. B.B., thank you very much for joining us, sir. Who Hello, good afternoon. Sessions. He's actually working while we're doing this. Uh, he is that dedicated. He, he, The dude can't take an hour off for a webcast. He's just on it. We have Brianna is on as well. So I don't know if Brianna's microphone um, is working or not, but she's always behind the scenes and always helping us out. Brian is on. So, Mr. Furman. Hello, everyone. I am the he, other Brian. He yep. is the other the Brian, other Brian. <laughs> the, yep. the non BB King one. We tried to come up with a cool nickname for Brian, and uh, he kept on trying to get us to call him T Bone, but we just called him Brian anyway. Um, Free Brian. There's CJ. CJ is the COO of Black Hills Information Security. And uh, Marcello is on as well. I think his mic is currently off, but now it's on. Hello, everybody. We're going through all these introductions because we also have a new member of the uh, crew today. Jason um, is on. Jason, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Because Hi. I've given you plenty of warning that I'm going to pick on you in just a couple of seconds. Well, thanks, John. Uh, I'm Jason Blanchard. I work in marketing. If you've ever heard, I've been on other webcasts. And you've probably seen me at a B-Sides or presenting at DerbyCon where I told you how to hack your way into getting your dream job. If you haven't seen it, that's a really good webcast to check out. So. And someday, hopefully, it works out for you. All right. So <laughs> sacred cash cow tipping. <laughs> Let's get started. So we need to have a chat, everybody. Um, the goal of this presentation is not to serve as a step-by-step -step guide, even though, God help me, um, somebody before the webcast started said that they went through the step-by-step -step guides from last year, and a lot of those techniques still work for bypassing endpoint security products. Um, look, I, I would like to think that the, the state of computer security is improving. It seems to me the state of endpoint security, especially when it comes to bypass, it is more difficult now than it was four years ago. And I don't know if anybody else on the BHIS side of the house uh, would like to speak to that, uh, just jump in. Uh, Joff, what are your thoughts? I'm pretty sure you probably would agree with me. There's improvements being made. Uh, I absolutely do agree with you. I think there's a significant number of vendors that have made forward progress uh, and made uh, pen testing more interesting and i like making pen testing more interesting because i don't want to be bored anyway so um, yeah. this is all good yep and, and that's one of the main themes of bhis is we're not out to try to make everything look leet we're not out trying to make it look like it's some type of really impossible task for anybody to do we want to learn things and then share those things as quickly with the entire community as we possibly can now a couple of additional disclaimers um, we're trying to show general principles and concepts and approaches and also some cool toolkits and some ideas once again not step-by-step -step guides because i've noticed periodically on some of the um, uh, the, the comment windows for some of our previous webcasts that are years old, people will be like, hey, I tried this and it doesn't work anymore. This guy's a total noob. And I'm like, that's literally a presentation from 2008, you jackass. Um, of course, it's not going to work anymore. So what worked yesterday is not necessarily going to work tomorrow. Also, I've noticed that this seems to be a BHIS snapshot in time. There's a heavy emphasis on carbon black at the moment in a lot of these different... Uh, step-by-step -step tutorials that we have for bypassing these different products. And that doesn't necessarily mean that Carbon Black has the lion's share of uh, endpoint bypass opportunities or that it's a flaming piece of crap. It just means quite literally our testers are working on environments right now for whatever reason we go in phases. And now it's Carbon Black 
protect phase. Um, if you go back a couple of months ago, everybody was running Silence about a month ago. For some reason, we were seeing lots of people use um, CrowdStrike. So it goes in these weird phases. Why? I honestly just do not know. Don't really care, but there's a lot of emphasis on Carbon Black here. We would like to throw a special thanks out to a number of great teams. And I was not able to capture absolutely all of the different teams and individuals that are just absolute rock stars and everything they do and people that we look up to and uh, we, we we just admire tremendously like sub t red canaries team of course sub t is on red canaries team specter ops absolutely an amazing group of individuals and i hope to god that we aren't doing a webcast on top of specter ops again um, we're going to be partnering up with specter ops on a webcast i think in the future we're just looking for a topic and speaking of topics and partnering hacking dave of course dave kennedy we're going to be doing a webcast with him shortly as well the entire trusted sex team um sans instructors ops nomad Pone Dizzle, Malcolm McVetter, who is just one of the coolest people I've ever met. Ian's faculty, Harm Joy, also part of Spectre Ops, Elitist, and there's tons of people out there. And this is not meant to be exhaustive. These are just basically the people that um, basically I pull off the top of my head fairly quickly. So all of this is being done specifically to make organizations and individuals aware that any point security solution can and will be bypassed. And this is a theme that'll be coming up on again and again and again and again. And while I see a lot of vendors are getting better at pushing the narrative that they are not the silver bullet anymore. Silence was probably the worst uh, vendor a number of years ago, and they've gotten much, much, much better. They use, still use strong marketing language, but they're not saying stop 100% of tax or stop all attacks anymore, which I think is great. But all that being said, we still have a lot of management, in particular management, that are looking for those solutions that are going to stop absolutely everything. And that just doesn't really exist. So this is all the stuff I just got done talking about. Believe it or not, this is literally the only slide that I've gone over so far. Um, a note on configurations. Um, with any endpoint security product that you are using, configurations matter. Um, whenever you're looking at Silence, Silence is not just Silence, right? Silence has a whole bunch of different configurations that you can reduce the overall effectiveness of that product drastically if you don't enable, say, like whitelisting. And I've said many times, whitelisting is not a specific feature in a product that they own. Everybody should be enabling whitelisting. But that's just an example. You can shut that off. You can turn the high enforcement mode off. And it makes that product a lot less secure than it would be normally. You could allow PowerShell scripts with something like Silence or even Carbon Black. And all of a sudden, there's huge security issues that you are now allowing through. And we see a lot of organizations that'll take their core configurations of these products and they will reconfigure them in such a way to allow certain applications to run. Now, some of these techniques may have taken advantage of those configurations. We don't go through and try to look at every single detailed configuration per se, but yeah, that actually does happen more often than I think anybody would like, especially the vendors. Also, personally, I'm starting to like a lot of these companies. Yeah, even Silence. And uh, I, I've talked about this on some webcasts and Joff can back me up. I don't know if Joff still has the bottles of beer. I'm sure they didn't last long in his house, but Silence at our last Sacred Cash Cow tipping. It was our last one, wasn't it, Joff? I think it was, yeah. Yeah. We had Sacred Cash Cow tipping, and Joff came up with some novel ways of bypassing Silence. And we were kind of thinking that they might try to sue us, and they didn't. Instead, we got this nice box, this little letter that said, thanks to the BHIS team, and uh, you know, trying to keep the industry honest as a whole. And they sent us all kinds of different beer, which was great. However, if I got to looking at the names of some of these beers that they gave us, um, the name, this one is called Dead Man's Game, which is kind of interesting. <laughs> yeah, I think um, one of them was the Grim Reaper or something. Yeah, like. this is Judgment Day. It's got yeah. it's got raisins because when I think of death, I think of raisins, right? Um, and then <laughs> Serpent Stout. And then there was like Judgment Day and all kinds of different things. So I tried not to read too much into the names. But we had a great meeting with the uh, Silence team and they were just fantastic. And they told Joff and I on the phone, they're trying to turn over a new leaf. And that was really cool to see. And that was awesome. And some people would be like, well, you and Joff totally sold out. Yeah, we sold out for three, <laughs> three bottles of beer. Our price is pretty low, right? And a lot of the things that we discover oftentimes are like little goofy quirks. I think Joff wins the award for the goofiest, weirdest, that should not have worked quirk 
um, out of all of the different presentations that we have here. Um, so what I want you all to do is take this presentation, modify it, find new quirks, work with the vendors, and then everybody gets better. And that's the way it should be, right? It shouldn't be something where we just trust a vendor blindly. It shouldn't be something where we immediately go and say, here's a zero day. It's just, that's just crappy, right? And on that note, Special note to vendors, stop bullying your customers. Some vendors have gotten a lot better lately and that's fantastic. If you do decide to start bullying your customers or red teamers or pen testers, we will come after you. And I don't mean just Black Hills Information Security. I mean, we, the pen testing community, will absolutely come after you. Be nice and will be nice. You cannot silence people with a contract. If you look at the Consumer Review Fairness Protection Act, uh, what is it, 15 US Code 45B, you cannot have in your contract that says that your customers cannot speak publicly about what they find as shortcomings in your products. Even if your lawyers say that they can, which is wrong, all of those clauses have been retroactively invalidated by the United States government. So don't. You can't enforce it legally. You look like an ass when you do try to enforce it. It does not engender goodwill in the entire community. And more importantly, it's not going to put fear in the hearts of every security researcher that's out there. Be nice and we'll be nice as well. Take the feedback, take the bypass techniques, fix the issues, and we will as well. So I'm gonna hand it over to Brian. Um, he's going to be talking about Trend Micro, which once again, we'll be talking about some techniques and I want all of the conversation to start stopping around, uh, well, that product's just crap. Uh, that's, that's not really true anymore. Uh, but Brian had a nifty way, uh, kind of an articulative way of getting around Trend Micro. And Brian, are you ready, sir? I am ready. Awesome. I'm going to be your finger. Um, so I'll progress the slides as you say to. So we'll kick this one off right here. Sounds good. Um, so the approach I used here with the Trend Micro, micro C-sharp memory map file, um, full disclosure, Joff, um, as far as I know, Joff is the first one to introduce all of us to, um, to this method. Um, and so I kind of piggybacked off of this, uh, made just a couple different uh, little uh, changes for myself and moved forward with that. Um, but basically, um, is this the right slide? Oh, weird. There's like extra bullet points I added in there. Them. I added them in to oh, you added them? <laughs> what memory okay. map files were. Sorry, I added some of that in. Yeah, so. yeah, no, no problem. Yeah, so basically a memory map file is, um, it's just, you can, you can map it uh, directly into, into memory, uh, manipulate it once it's in memory. And the, the way that I do this, though, is rather than having one uh, contiguous array that I map into memory all at once, I actually have it right uh, into memory one single byte at a time. And I'll talk about that a little bit more uh, once we get to that part. And so we write up that shell code into memory one byte at a time, execute that shell code, and we win. So um, first thing you need to do is you need to generate up uh, your payload. I actually have a script. You can go up on GitHub right now, and you can grab this down. It's a Python script that I put together. You can think of it somewhat as a front end for MSF Venom, because that's really all it's calling on the back end. So it has your basic payloads, your reverse TCP, your reverse HTTP, reverse HTTPS. Um, and you can select your architecture, your, your host, your port, all the things that you would normally select when you're using MSF Venom to generate up this payload. And so you, you go and grab the script, and you'll notice that I have it called C-sharp MM niceness, which is memory mapped niceness. I thought it was C-sharp mm, niceness. <laughs> I, like that mm, I thought yeah. it was anyway. <laughs> that works too, double meaning. So uh, so what I found, John, I mentioned this uh, earlier, kind of the, the pre-webcast portion of this, is that I found that some vendors are literally alerting on the word shellcode. So if you have uh, you have your source code file, your PowerShell file, whatever have you. If you have the word shellcode in there, some vendors will alert on that. Uh, Microsoft has actually gotten really good. So with their AMSI, which some of you guys might have run into, they not only will detect it in the source file itself, but even after it's compiled, once you run that, they'll start in, uh, doing inspection on your program and they can actually detect variable names after the program is run if you have the word shellcode in there. So I just went ahead, I replaced it with the word niceness, which can always uh, generate some kind of funny little puns throughout there, like invoke niceness and things like that. But anyways, uh, so just simple uh, search replace, and that alone will get past some vendors, which is just a major face bomb. Um, next slide, please. So after you run that script, you run that Python script, what you're going to get is you're going to get a C-sharp code file. Now, when you download that repo, you'll see that I have a template, a C-sharp 
a source code file template. And basically all that Python file is doing is after it generates up the payload, it's going to inject that shell code into the source file. And you can see here what's happening is you have one line for every single byte of that shell code that's being written one byte at a time. And the reason that I did this is I found that uh, some vendors were actually, they'll, they'll look at the array, they'll, they'll pull out the array, whether from your source code file, uh, so some will pull it right out of the source code file, others will actually detect it, um, the array, once it's loaded into, into memory, so not into memory using this method, but once the array is declared, instantiated, um, they will actually detect that if you have one contiguous array of shellcode. So the way that I got around that is I have it so it just writes one byte at a time. So it can't chain all that together unless it's doing um, full memory inspection, which uh, Defender's pretty good at. But for this purpose, Trend Micro is not good at that. So after you've got your, uh, your C-sharp file generated, just transfer it over to the Windows system. Now, you need to do a compilation for this. So again, it's a, it's a source code file, not a binary file. You could uh, compile this before you transfer it over. I personally like to compile it on my target system because sometimes there are rules that are in place, uh, trust rules, so that if a program comes from somewhere other than the computer, it's automatically not trusted. But if the program originates from the computer itself, then sometimes it will move into that, uh, that trust area. And so that's why I like to compile it on the machine itself. And this is not hard. Um, you're using the built-in CSC tool. And if you look at the top of that source code file that gets generated, I actually have instructions for you. You should be able to just drag and drop that into a command prompt. It'll compile and you are off and running. So I just threw this in here just so you guys can see that I'm just using the interpreter payload and listener. I'm sure all of you guys have seen this hundreds of times, but uh, here it is again, just for uh, continuity. Uh, we found a, like a weird little quirk. So if you run something uh, direct, if you run this program directly from the PowerShell console, uh, Trend Micro will pop up a little window that says suspicious file blocked. Now you can go ahead and you can bypass that and you can tell it to open up the file anyways and it'll run it no problem, but it gives you a little warning. But the weird quirk what we found is that it doesn't care if you run it from it basically anywhere else. So you can double click it, Trend Micro doesn't care. You can run it from your normal cmd.exe, Trend Micro doesn't care. And you can pop open a PowerShell prompt and if you, from within the PowerShell prompt, call cmd.exe and then pass in the program as, a, as an argument, it, it won't pop up either. So it only cares if you execute it directly from the PowerShell console. So I guess they've just added in a rule that says anything that comes from here, it's suspicious, uh, block it. Strange, but easily you can easily get around it. Uh, finally, boom, win, you've got your shell and you are ready to go. Very That's cool. Yep. All right, BB. Um, do you want to take a few minutes and talk about uh, using one of Joff's techniques to get around uh, carbon black defense? Sure. Uh, sure. I will, be, I will be your fingers and clicking forward then. There we go. Quick, uh, quick preemptory question earlier. Someone was talking about what version of carbon black. You know, I don't know what version it was. This is just, yeah, I don't know exactly what the version numbers were. And a lot of this stuff, it doesn't, doesn't really, like once again, Remember the goal of this, at least what it's kind of evolved into, is we're not trying to say here's specific ways to get around this specific version because hopefully, I mean, back me up, baby, hopefully this stuff has been fixed, right? The idea is that, uh, you know, what are the processes that we go through as far as thinking through how to get past these endpoint products? Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, that that's exactly what this one illustrates. This is this is um, you you can have great tools, but if they're not configured correctly or told to look for the right things, then you end up with a, a bypass. This I wouldn't really call it a bypass. I mean, it is a bypass, but it's not like the tool failed. It's just it wasn't configured correctly, and yep. that's kind of what this one is. So this was on a um, a test that we do at BHIS called it's a, a C2 test. So it's not a pen test so much as uh, we're looking for like clipping levels of what do you detect and what do you not detect. And uh, so the, we start with stuff that everyone should detect. So this is the uh, the first few things we did, just um, interpreter, 32-bit interpreter, just you know, no obfuscation, uh, using the default template that's in the, that's built in that uh, Apache bench. Uh, binary that's built in there. Everything should find that. And this one, it, it did. We found that. We found the 64-bit version. Um, we got into some of the, the MITRE attack framework. We're trying to classify those things this way. So we did some obfuscation, and uh, it still found those. And uh, what else did we do? We obfuscated stageless, uh, so just variations on the theme here. And, and those all got caught too. 
Yeah. So in the, with this particular kind of uh, spreadsheet breakdown, this isn't complete. You know, whenever BB or any of our testers is doing that type of C2 pivot, it's to try multiple different types of uh, multiple different types of AV bypass techniques to see what can in fact be detected and then typing it back to the MITRE ATT&CK technique matrix. So you get that gap analysis. And most of the standard I, BB, I would say most of the crappy blacklisted products that are out there, they don't even do this well, right? Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And these, yeah, that's where you can beat on the product a little bit. But in this case, it's just, I think, a configuration item. And then uh, here's where things kind of started to go sideways here. Right. So we keep going down the list and we, um, I like to start with the obvious stuff and get more advanced from there. Other testers take the other opposite approach. But um, so we, we went on to uh, process injection and I just used, again, just the, the default tools in, um, in uh, MSF Venom and uh, to inject the meterpreter into a PowerShell process, uh, all the default stuff, and that just worked. Uh, it wasn't detected, uh, it ran successfully, and it established the, the C2 channel. And do a nice shout out to uh, Dave Kennedy and his team. Unicorn is fantastic. Um, I think yeah. it's probably one of the most maintained tools uh, for whenever it comes for endpoint security bypass. They just do a fantastic job of all kinds of cool techniques that are useful at that specific point in time. They they really do, um, and that's what that second line in there is was unicorn. It was the, the the same technique, but just done by the the unicorn process, whatever that was at the time, and that worked as well. And then um, another delivery method, the HTA files, the the uh, hypertext application things that um, that Microsoft has. Uh, you can download an application that's got HTML in it and also uh, other code, and it runs in the browser and does things that you can't normally do in a browser because of same origin policy and all that kind of stuff. So uh, these worked as well, just the straight out of the box MSF Venom uh, version and the Unicorn version, those both worked as well. So against Carbon Black, which is, which is pretty awesome in most cases, uh, but here I guess it was just not configured to be looking for these types of things. I think this was, I think this was a new install. I think this was a new product in the environment that I was working on here. So they were still tweaking it and yeah. figuring out where all the levers were and everything. Getting it tuned properly. Yeah. All right, right. Well, thank you so much. All right. Now the next one of these things that should not work. Uh, Joff, hand it over to you. <laughs> um, so this one was one of these, uh, to put it in Tim Medine's words, this was hacking dumberly. Um, so uh, again, we were in the context of Carbon Black and uh, uh, you know, they're whitelisting, um, and as many customers are doing these days, um, and I applaud them for doing so, um, only allowing legitimate binaries uh, to execute. Um, how the rules are configured uh, is going to vary uh, per environment. And uh, one, of the, uh, one of the issues I ran into recently was uh, PowerShell was prevented. Um, now, we all know, um, or many of us know, that, that just because PowerShell.exe might be prevented from running, um, usually doesn't uh, does not mean that you can't uh, either compile some custom DLL or get some other code to actually load the system management automation uh, set of DLLs to get you access to the .NET framework. Um, but I didn't have to go that far. Um, in this particular case, I quite literally copied PowerShell.exe to another name. Uh, in this case, it was p.exe. Why p.exe? Because that's the first letter that came to mind. Um, and uh, ran PowerShell as p.exe. And uh, lo and behold, um, I got a PowerShell session up and running uh, in a whitelisted environment. Um, so the, the next slide you can see, um, this was the first deny where it's saying, hello, carbon black protection blocked access uh, by CMDXE to PowerShell.exe. You're not allowed to run PowerShell. Um, and of course, I um, I can't even take credit for this, to be honest. Um, I uh, reached out to some other testers on the channel um, that we have, and I said, hey, um, anybody got a carbon black protection bypass? And uh, one of the guys said, um, yeah, I think you could just copy it to another file name. I'm like, okay, well, I'll try that. Um, so next slide, um, I literally have a screenshot where uh, <laughs> um, I copied uh, PowerShell.exe to P.exe and ran p.exe-exact bypass, and I had a PowerShell session up and running. Um, crazy simple stupid, right? Um, no you know, crazy memory mapping, no crazy injection technique, um, just uh, 
straight up copying the binary to another which file is, name. Which is uh, embarrassing. Like whenever you try to do all kinds of wicked cool kung fu and then something like this works, it's like, God. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, you know, I think um, what's going on here is that it's probably a misconfiguration on product install. Um, it's probably something where the vendor, um, in this case, uh, Calvin Black's going to come in and go, no, you got your rules slightly misconfigured or our consultant misconfigured things and and they can fix it. But, you know, it's amazing. Um, sometimes hacking doesn't have to be that hard. It's amazing what you can do. Now, now one speaking, of, the, of, speaking oh, of hard, I wouldn't let you just get away with just renaming PowerShell to p.exe for sacred cash cow tipping. So you went a little bit further. Um, <laughs> right. On things. So this is a generalized um, technique that I use uh, quite a lot. Um, you know, we're all aware that if you try to get some sort of custom compiled entity, either compiled in real time on a system, or you are trying to actually bring down a DLL or an executable, and if it touches the disk, that is the time at which your typical AV products are going to jump on it. They're going to, you know, examine it, look at what's in there, and um, certainly if it has any kind of unencoded shell code that is going to match a signature, they're going to jump up and down immediately and go, hey, this is not cool. Um, you're trying to bring shell code into the environment. And so quite often on our C2 and pivot tests where we have access to an internal system that is granted in the beginning, if I can get access to PowerShell again, I will, instead of bringing something down to disk, just put a cradle together quickly in PowerShell, manually typed commands to bring something down into memory. Now, the other thing that you run into here is that a lot of perimeter proxies and a lot of IPS systems or combination perimeter proxy IPSs, they'll see a PowerShell script coming up down uh, across the network and they will jump up and down and go, uh-oh, this is a PowerShell script. And even worse, if the PowerShell script has the string mimicats in it or shellcode in it and so on, they're going to block it. But it turns out that an old friend of ours called Base64 is pretty nice in terms of being able to evade those things still to this day. So next slide, John. Um, if we generate a payload first, um, in this case, we're just using Meterpreter again, reverse TCP, and we're using a PowerShell script as the format of the payload. Um, we are encrypting it. Um, as we are encrypting it, I'm sorry, we are encoding, encoding it, it as we uh, generate that payload uh, so that the shell code it's is just, unique. Yeah, it's going to get us death threats, right? So. Yeah, I know, so it's encrypt. Anyway, <laughs> I, I pretty much um, default to a prime number for suspicious mathematical brain reasons um, of either three iterations or seven iterations for the encoding. Um, and then I'll just crank up a Python server on the... Uh, internet facing system where the payload is. And then back in the customer environment, next slide please, John. There it is. I will just create a new web object, a very simple technique, and then I will use w.download string to download the base64 encoded PowerShell script that is on my internet facing system. And then it's a one liner in PowerShell to decode that base64 back to its original PowerShell script and then you can use the interactive uh, IEX uh, interactive interpreter portion of PowerShell to actually execute the script block which in this case will give us a interpreter shell and the script has never touched the disk so it is not visible other than as it comes across the network in base64 form into PowerShell's memory and then it's only decoded in PowerShell process memory so that trick works fairly well at evading most things. I haven't had anything jump up and down in that case uh, to uh, stop me from doing so. And of course, you have to put in the the pleasing slide of, oh, look, there is the encoded stage coming in and the interpreter shell uh, going uh, back to the uh, internet facing system. So we're all good and, and off we go. So that's a fun little trick, just a simple PowerShell uh, cradle uh, with base 64 and I guess we're turning it over to Marcello at this point. Okay, so um, there is some background information, a little background information that I need to convey in order for to completely understand how this works. Um, so the .NET DLR, what is it? The .NET DLR is essentially 
a way for scripting languages to hook into the .NET framework. So unlike C, unlike C Sharp, where it's not a scripting language, you can actually create .NET languages that are scripting languages and make them hook into the .NET framework. Some, of, some examples of this are Iron Python, Iron Ruby, and Boolang. Now, the great thing about this is it, pro it provides a number of advantages in terms in term of creating malicious payloads. Um, one of them is that you don't have to keep recompiling your payloads all the time. And two is that it provides an crazy amount of evasion um, and uh, complete access to the .NET API. So um, in the offensive DLR repo, which uh, I think John right now is showing, Basically, there are a bunch of yeah, there's a bunch of proof of concept code and examples on how to do this. One and also I I also created a separate project that sort of tries to weaponize this as well called Silent Trinity. What uh, we're going to be looking at today is actually how to inject shell code using something called Boolag, which is again one of those .NET languages, uh, .NET scripting languages. So John, if you can go back to the yeah the Word document there. So the C# -sharp payload that you actually put on disk does not contain any code that actually does shellcode injection. All it does is it embeds a compiler or a interpreter inside the C-sharp payload itself and then compiles the scripting language, whatever scripting language you give it on the fly to memory. The actual script, the actual script which in this case is just shellcode.boo, it's just a text file actually has all of the shell code injection code in it. So we just embed the, boo, the Boolang compiler inside the C sharp code. We give it the shell code.boo file. You can actually embed the source code within the C sharp binary itself, but for ease of understanding, I just did it this way. And uh, you can then paste the shell code directly into the shell code.boo file and inject it that way. All right, so we have our C sharp payload which embeds the Boolean compiler. We have our shellcode.boo file, which actually has the shellcode injection code. Uh, if you can scroll down just a bit, uh, we then generate our shellcode using MSF Venom. In this particular case, we're going to be bypassing uh, Sophos intercept X, if I recall correctly, I think it's called. One thing to note about Sophos is that it does actually detect non-encoded um, uh, interpreter shellcode in memory. So we're just going to encode it with XOR in this case to get rid of that problem. And if you could go to the next page, John. Well, there we go. We got our shellcode. And there, then we just have to paste that shellcode into the... <laughs> Sorry, dude. I think I think I think my screen is like three seconds behind you, so I apologize. No, no, no worries, no worries. I, I think I, I think that anyway. No. <laughs> it's like whenever you watch people sometimes, like grandparents use a computer, you're like, click the start button, grandpa, and the mouse just slowly goes across the screen, like they're willing it with every fiber of their being to go where it needs to go. So yeah, sorry. I think it's a little bit behind us, but. No and all we do then is, is we paste the shell code into the actual Boolean script. We compile our um, C sharp code directly on the endpoint. This and the great thing about this is that we're decoupling execution, shell code execution from the actual payload, if that makes any sense. So like you can drop the compiler on this without actually uh, putting your actual payload to this because your actual payload is just the script. Once we compile that. Uh, we then, we just, that's just a screenshot of Sophos there. We set up a Metasploit listener. You run the actual C sharp code that has the embedded compiler, and we get a shell. Now, you mentioned down here, this is just the tip of the iceberg. You, you talk a lot, um, and this also goes back to like Silent Trinity, if you want to talk a little bit about that too, um, and Iron Python. Why do you think this is just the tip of the iceberg from what you've found so far with some of the uh, research that you've done with Silent Trinity and .NET DLR? Well, the reason why this works great right now is because there are no optics into the .NET framework at all in terms of uh, ways of EDR solutions actually hook into the .NET framework and inspect what's going on. And because of .NET reflect, uh, .NET's reflection properties, you can just what you can basically do what the equivalent is is a reflective DLL injection natively within .NET, which is just like calling assembly.load. Uh, and because of that, you can embed entire scripting languages and compilers inside the framework 
And from a red team perspective, this has an, a crazy amount of advantages. Um, you'll always bypass AMZ because it's not, it's just not there. Although uh, with .NET 4.8, the beta version of .NET 4.8, which I came out recently, they actually do have and AMZ. So, just so people know, AMZ is the anti-malware service, correct? Yeah, that is correct. And uh, you can decouple the actual payload from the execution. And uh, another great thing about this approach is that usually these scripting languages have a way of calling native methods. So the actual methods that you need to call, for example, to perform shellcode injection. Uh, in Boolang's case, um, the, the, this is done by dynamically creating IL code, the intermediate language code, directly in memory, and then executing that on the fly. So like nothing touches disk. Uh, and there are no calls to CSE.exe uh, made so as opposed to uh, using add type in PowerShell, for example, where you would actually see CSE.exe being run so that it compiles C sharp. Um, and it allows for quick retooling and scripting capabilities. But there, I'm, it's still like an ongoing research project. Um, I just put out a couple of examples on the repository that you're showing right now, one that actually has a PowerShell script. So the invoke jump scare script, for example, actually embeds the Boolang compiler within PowerShell itself. And that basically goes through AMZ and a lot of EDR and endpoint solutions as well. Uh, invoke Iron Python, the same thing with Iron Python, and then a bunch of C Sharp examples um, that do this as well. And a lot of this actually came from your research just basically on the Iron Python stuff, right? Yes, that's correct. Like, I started with Iron Python just because I'm sort of a Python fanatic, um, and I, I just love Python. But the more I researched it, the more I realized that th there are a bunch of other languages that you can do this with as well. Boolang in particular is very, um, is very attractive just because of the way it compiles creates IL code and allows you to natively call met, uh, call native methods. Um, with Iron Python, it's a little bit harder to do that. But uh, Boolang specifically is really, really awesome. And I'm probably going to be adding that to Silent Trinity as well. So I was going to ask, what is the difference between Silent Trinity and your offensive DLR that you've been working on? Or is the offensive DLR something that is eventually going to be loaded into Silent Trinity? So uh, there, yeah, that, that's definitely one of the, uh, but that's definitely going to happen. Uh, it, I'm definitely going to be adding Boolang support to Silent Trinity. Uh, the reason why I created Offensive DLR was because there is some overhead in installing Silent Trinity right now. Um, and also, it's it's basically beerware. Like, it really is not stable. Uh, there are still a lot of bugs. So I created the Offensive DLR repo so that um, you can create these payloads yourself without the overhead of installing the the framework, the complete framework, and uh, to actually just sort of get other researchers out there to take a look and and maybe find other ways of going about doing the same thing. How how big is the payload that you deliver? Oh, that's actually a great question. So, um, it depends. It depends on the way you build it because you can actually hook. So you can actually create the payload and without the actual needed assemblies, and you can just hook the at domain assembly resolve event which tells the c sharp payload how to resolve the assemblies so you can basically compile it it'll probably be around 200 kilobyte uh, kilobytes and compile it and basically uh, on execute on runtime the payload will either go out to the internet download the needed assemblies or uh, you can actually tell it to resolve the assemblies by embedding embedding the assemblies themselves within the resources of the C sharp payload, if that makes any sense. So uh, you can actually add your own logic to the assembly uh, resolving, native assembly resolving logic in .NET. Uh, so it, the payload can be really, really small. Cool. And I think uh, by like by default, the Silent Trinity payload is like 200 kilobytes, and that's pretty much the same with the, the yeah, example. It just pulls down what it needs when it needs it, right? I mean, it's basically just kind of setting up like a little stager and then pulling down the rest of the functionality on runtime. Yep. Cool. So we have some questions um, that I would like to ask, and I think some of them are general questions for the audience. Uh, Marcus asked, uh, so for those of you that presented, just kind of unmute your mics. Could all of this be summarized as just simply creating custom versions of PowerShell that there is no visibility into for defenders? I'm not sure that's the case, John. I, I um... 
I think it's more of custom versions of things that have access to the .NET framework, uh, because what um, what Marcello is talking about is stuff that's you know accessing the DLR um, in general, um, assemblies coming down to the system uh, by whatever mechanism are a useful thing to be able to do. So it's not just about PowerShell. And and it looks to me like a lot of what you guys are doing is you got an end state whenever you're gonna where you're gonna get some execution, right? You're gonna be communicating to .NET, right? And you're using PowerShell to access into that. And you're just basically finding more doors to access the same thing that PowerShell itself would execute. Not necessarily executing PowerShell or different versions of PowerShell. You're basically jumping the way that you're actually communicating to the exact same endpoints that PowerShell itself communicates to. I think that's relatively, yeah, I think that's a true statement. Um, you know, we're talking about whatever way we can get at the power of the .NET framework. It might even be um, Visual Basic. It might be PowerShell. It might be uh, assemblies that are dynamically loaded with some sort of stager. If you can get to the .NET framework, you can get an, an awful lot of power to go from there. Uh, and uh, you know, there, there's multiple different ways in. I wonder if Michelle has a comment on that one too. This is like all of the basically the way I like to summarize this. It's all the power of PowerShell without going through PowerShell because. PowerShell is so powerful because it accesses the, all of the .NET APIs, right? So with the DLR, um, you can do the same thing only in a completely other language. So for example, Python, like Iron Python is just basically a .NET language, a .NET language implementation of the Python language. So you yeah. can Python just uh, dynamically access .NET APIs as you would do with PowerShell. And you can do everything that PowerShell does. Like you can even embed like C sharp code within Iron Python and compile that on the fly, like you would do in PowerShell. Like it's it's basically the same exact thing. Now, um, want to bring in Brian here, Brian? So, how does this tie into tools that you've worked on in the past? Things like Powerline. Just similar things. Just uh, I guess other ways of kind of um, abusing, if you will, the the .NET language, just uh, .NET framework. Just because you you can only lock it down so much before things are just going to stop working. I mean, it's it's an inherent fundamental portion of Windows. And so that's one of the big reasons we go after it is it gives us so much functionality and there are only so many different ways that, that you can restrict that to keep people from using it. And so, um, so yes, I, I think that we're all just kind of, we're coming up with creative ways to, uh, to be able to leverage uh, that functionality um, for bypasses and, and things like that. Cool. And I'm going to keep you on the line um, because Stefan asked a question that I think you could probably answer as well. Have you messed with Golang? And if so, have you had any success with uh, with Golang? Yes, in fact. Um, I think last, it was on last year's webcast maybe or the no, year before? It was, One, it was two years ago. Two with years ago. Yep, go right. Yeah, GoCat. Yep. Um, so yeah, no, go, Golang is fantastic too. Um, it's pretty easy to uh, to whip up uh, a kind of a rudimentary uh, C2 payload so you can send it send and uh, execute commands, get responses back. And we definitely have had good uh, success with that. And it's nice because it's uh, cross-platform, so you can compile it for Linux, yeah. you can compile it for Windows, and and go go forth with that. Um, so any other questions, please bring them in. I'm going through. Do you think adding any of these techniques or calls to the libraries and ML data sets in order, to, I think he's talking about, uh, Joseph is talking about machine learning data sets to assist in detection. And I think that's probably just kind of touching on a much larger question, right, Joseph, about how can these techniques, like what everyone's talking about machine learning and artificial intelligence and how it's going to revolutionize computer security and detecting malware, and just kind of setting it up. I know, I know Brian's probably gonna come right back and try to answer this question because he knows quite a bit about it, much more than I do. But with artificial intelligence, one of the problems that you're running into is the fidelity and the quality of the data that's actually being fed into the artificial intelligence, uh, for, for lack of a better word, sandboxes. So in order for machine learning and artificial intelligence to start flagging things as malicious, it either has to be trained explicitly to say that it's not part of a whitelist of approved uh, kind of behavior and execution on a computer system, or it has to learn that it's actually malicious in the way that it actually runs. And kind of setting that up so the rest of BHIS can kind of answer that. Do you think machine learning ever has a point where it's where it's going to be able to start catching up with all the little like uh, bypass techniques that everybody seems to come up with all the time for getting around a lot of these products that do purport out of the box to use artificial intelligence? I think it's a it's a cat and mouse game as it always is. Um, one of the things I noticed to give an example 
um, is that Microsoft has done really good work with Windows Defender in 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 the last uh, couple of years, and um, you know one of the one of the techniques I was using was was uh, firing off some shell code. Um, which uh, created a listener, um, you know, typical uh, interpreter, reverse TCP, reverse HTTPS or something like that. Um, and the technique itself was not getting detected on a signature basis, but the timing between when the shell code was placed into memory and the actual network connection uh, was initiated um, actually triggered uh, some, some clearly some uh, ML or AI code uh, in Defender to actually flag that as potentially malicious. Now, my response to that was to put a uh, random delay in the thread that I was creating uh, to put that in memory between, you know, something like 300 and 700 milliseconds. And then uh, suddenly Windows Defender was blind again. So there's always this cat and mouse game that's going on when we're, we're talking about evasion uh, and we're talking about AI and ML techniques to actually um, learn and improve. Uh, one of the other ones that Mar Marcello and I were talking about a little while back was... Uh, some bypass techniques that we were doing with HTA files uh, and looking at the J script that we had in the HTA file and um, discovering again, I think it was Windows Defender was actually seeing um, the highly randomized, highly entropic variable names and treating them as potentially malicious. So, you know, our response was to rewrite some code using an English dictionary for the variable names instead of highly entropic variable names. And uh, again, you know, the the uh, the code was blinded to to the intent. So, it, it's that kind of cat and mouse game, um, Brian. Yeah, no, I, I think that uh, both of you guys hit on on some of the the main points. There is is one. I mean, it's it's dependent on how good your training set is. So, are you truly mimicking a, an actual environment with with thousands of users? Is that what the training set is on? And if so, how are you certain that 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 environment isn't already compromised and that those things aren't getting into uh, to your data set and messing with your training? And then the other aspect of that is what you had mentioned, Joff, which is generalization. How well after after your um, your neural network or uh, machine learning, whatever you whatever you have, once that's trained, how well does that generalize to other things? How well can it handle things that it hasn't seen before, and just slight variations on that behavior? Um, from my yeah. perspective, from my yeah, I mean my my opinion on it is I think right now it's just a lot of marketing stuff. It's just people like the fancy words like AI, machine learning, and all that. I personally don't think that it's the best application for AI machine learning. I mean I'm a huge fanatic of it, but I think that there's just some things that you can do better by just looking at the different characteristics and implementing your own rule sets uh, for that. I think that um, it's it's a lot more. Uh, likely to be adaptable. You, you can go and you can make changes. You can add little things here and there without having to retrain your entire network. Um, so personally, I'm not a big fan of it for uh, for that type of application. But you know, we'll see. We'll have to just have to see where it goes and where it ends up. It does and depend on the um, uh, on the characteristics, the feature classification that's included in the algorithms. Basically, um, the short version of of AI is you're going to see one of two approaches for the most part. You're going to see random decision trees or, or decision forests with feature characteristics in the uh, that are used for the training data sets, or alternatively, you're going to see a neural network like approach. And I think it's more likely to be the former, to be honest. That that that'll be feature classification, and of course, these feature classification uh, training uh, entities can be changed over time. But again, it comes back down to the cat and mouse game. Well, and even stepping beyond the cat and mouse game, in the past, we have seen these artificial intelligence anti-malware suites actually nuke legitimate files. And a lot of times the way that that's actually done is basically some tester somewhere is actually training the algorithm that they are, in fact, evil by sprinkling evil into something again and again. Let's just say I, one I remember from years ago is Chrome.exe, uh, one of them nuked Chrome from the systems, uh, from all of their customers' systems. And that was kind of funny, but how a lot of these vendors handle that is they say, okay, this is explorer.exe. Don't ever, ever, ever nuke explorer.exe. But then it gets into the question of what are the metrics that they're using to actually have the artificial intelligence engine and the AV product determine that that is in fact explorer.exe. Is it the name? Is it the hash? If it's not the hash, what are the different attributes associated with it? And the more you can make your malware look like that software that's on the whitelist, 
the more successful you're going to be. And using that explore.exe example, this is some, one of the uh, techniques that was de uh, kind of demonstrated by David Fletcher uh, two years or one summer ago, two summers ago, where he simply renamed PowerShell.exe, which was bad, don't ever let it run, and he just re renamed it to explore.exe. And there was enough overlap. They were both written and signed by Microsoft, and all of a sudden, PowerShell.exe was now named Explorer.exe. There was enough overlap there that it was able to bypass. Um, it was able to bypass that specific product. And somebody is telling me that specific trick still works with some of these engines. So it has a lot to do with, as Brian said, the data sets and the training that goes into it. And then more importantly, for those of us that are doing security testing and security engineering, it's being able to find those gray areas um, as well. Yeah, I think so, the uh, the true success is always had in post analysis, right? When people start tracing back process trees and looking at what created what, they they start getting into interesting areas. But you know, obviously the horse is bolted in a lot of cases mm -hmm. uh, in, in that situation. Um, it actually does raise a whole another discussion, which we do have um, we have worked with as well, and that is rewriting the parent process information uh, for what you're creating in memory. Um, that's a technique that you're having to do these days for EDR. So we could probably spend the afternoon talking about those things. So I won't go into it right now. And there's some really cool research that's coming out with messing with process IDs as well. And I think that that's probably going to be a topic of a future webcast uh, coming up. It is um, certainly going to give um, uh, the, the carbon blacks of the world uh, things to think about. Well, and let, let's be honest, right? I mean, I, I think... Joff, Brian in particular, you two, because you guys were with me a long time ago in BB. Um, honestly, five years ago, this this whole entire webcast was kind of a joke, right? A uh, number of the <laughs> techniques, they were not all that hard. And then the next year, you know, Brian came up with uh, GoCat, which is really, really cool. And saw a lot of malware that was moving to Golang. But now it, it's interesting. There's still some of those techniques that bypass some of the base level antivirus, the blacklist stuff standard for like Symantec and McAfee, even though I'm sure that they would be kicking and screaming and saying, well, that's not us, but whatever. Um, but now we're starting to see it, as we said at the beginning, it's getting a lot more difficult to get by some of these products. And I think that that's awesome. It makes our jobs a lot more fun. Yeah, I think the EDR market definitely is heading in the right direction. They've definitely matured up a lot. Um, and uh, they're making our jobs harder. And um, I, you know, I think I said that earlier in the webcast. That that makes things fun and interesting. Thank you very much for coming. And we will see you in the next webcast. Marcello actually sent code. He's like, "Here's boo compiler. Compiler equals new. Boo compiler. Open parens close parens semicolon. Compiler parameters input. Add new string input. My script parent. Doot doot. 